Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, it is Monday, October 28th, 2024 at 6 p.m. in the Susan Tully Lively Boardroom at the 1887 building. I'd like to start out the evening by saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And, and to the republic for the two states, one nation, and under God, in its love, with liberty and liberty. Okay, uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order and have Mr. Tadlock do roll call, please. Mr. Andre. He's excused. I know he was excused. He was going to join. Oh, he was going to join. That's right. That's yeah. what he said. Uh, Mr. Gayhart? Here. Eric Gordon? Here. Mrs. Ingersoll? Here. Mrs. Costa? Here. Mrs. Reckles? Here. Mr. Scarrow? Here. Ms. Corpus? Here. And Mr. Jaime Sarabia? Here. Okay. Um, there is a quorum, so we will proceed. Um, I didn't receive any cards filled out for the community participation, so we'll skip over that. Next on the agenda is the Westside Elementary student presentation. So as they gather all of their things, I'd like to introduce our the second grade team. We have Mrs. Flash White, yeah. Ms. Smith, Ms. Hoffman, and uh, a bunch of students will come up and I'll let them talk, but they're gonna talk about uh, the Bridges uh, math curriculum that we're <laughs> so thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. We're here to celebrate our new Bridges math resource that you so graciously allowed us to utilize this year. Um, we are very thrilled to have several second graders with us tonight to be able to have some fun, engaging time to share a component of our resource with you. We, they are going to be sharing some workplace games with you in just a few minutes, but we thought it would, might be helpful for you to understand how that workplace works within their math day. So we're just going to briefly just give you a quick overview of what our math looks like in a typical day. There are... Oh, sorry. It, it, yeah, it, number but, four or six. Yeah, one above it. There you go. There yeah. you go. But well, it's, it's the wrong. Oh, okay. Well, it's it's the wrong. Wrong. I Right. Why do I have the right link and you don't? <laughs> is so uh, your link is showing a different one? Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. Bridges, yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did you email this to you right now? Yeah, yeah. yeah you want yeah, email. Right, what am I just forwarding the agenda? The agenda. Just forward the forward the agenda, yeah. <laughs> Yep, well, there are three main components to bridges, all right? <laughs> we, 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 we know them well. So um, the component, like I said, that we're going to be sh sharing with you in a second here is going to be the workplace component. Um, and these kind of are going to show you how fun and engaging and brain building those activities are. Um, but the other components we wanted to share with you as well. So number corner is one of the um, pieces of bridges that is a um, not only just a physical space in our room, but it's also a very important instructional tool. So in number corner, what we do is it's kind of like a calendar area where there's um, also a, usually a data collector in there. So there could be a graph, a chart, a table. Um, it's a place where we get together for about 15 to 20 minutes a day with our class, and it's really community building. It's very fun and exciting. We talk often about how deep the conversation is during our number corner, where we lay the foundational um, pieces, the components for further skills, the kind of depth of understanding of uh, concepts and skills that are coming up in later units of study. So it's really front loads very well for our students. For example, right now we're working on some multiplication foundation, which is actually a third grade standard, but we're laying the foundation for that. So it's quite exciting. Um, Ms. Smith's gonna talk to you a little bit about problems and investigations. So problems and investigations are basically the way each lesson starts. And it starts with a teacher posing some sort of question, problem, investigation, and the students are given time to work independently and think independently. 
Then they come together in partnerships or groups of two or three, um, talk about their ideas, share different thoughts. And then lastly, they re reconvene as a whole class to share strategies and solutions and really work to deepen that conceptual understanding of what it is that we're, that we're learning. Okay, and then... Oh. oh, sorry, I should have. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So that was number four. Well, number four. There's some really cute pictures in there of number yeah. four. You can see the kiddos in action. <laughs> That's actually my um, whiteboard today. We did some um, repeated. <laughs> we did some repeated addition and laying the foundation, putting some multiplication as well. Nice. That was mine. <laughs> but you can see how actively engaged the kiddos are even in that main lesson they're all taking a part in building their understanding of the concepts and skills um, being discussed so workplaces is kind of well, well exactly what we're going to be showing with you today but it's kind of what we do at the end um it is practice for the skills and the strategies that we've learned in the problems and investigations portion of the lesson. So it offers them some ongoing practice with those skills and it allows them to engage with one another and collaborate with one another and share their ideas and share some laughs too. A lot of times it's fun and it's a little competitive, so they <laughs> seem to enjoy it a little bit. Um, so they're introduced as a whole class, like today we learned the game and then they've worked in partnerships and now it'll go into workplaces for the rest of the week and into the next couple of weeks as well. So they always have opportunities to revisit and continue to practice those skills over and over again. Um, so yeah, those are some of our pictures of some of the kiddos in our class enjoying um, workplaces. Sometimes they're smiling, sometimes they're looking very <laughs> thoughtful. <laughs> but it's really fun. And the kids seem to really be able to be engaged and build that deeper understanding of the skills that we're teaching in class because they're hands-on and learning from each other. Right. Yeah, in my 20 years of instruction, I don't think I've ever had a class that is this deeply engaged wow. in, in their mathematical thinking and their work and the depth of understanding that they're developing is just amazing to hear them speaking is mm -hmm. To hear them talking about different understandings and those aha moments, they're for real. Like yeah. <laughs> they're incredible. So um I guess let's get to the fun. Yeah. yeah. Oh, get to the fun. <laughs> so do you guys want to come on up? We have they have some games prepared that they're gotten very good at. Um this is Lucy Cheever and this is Lily Zigmund. Please forgive a seven-year-old, a little nervousness, but <laughs> they're not going to let this. <laughs> they're different than our type of Yeah. Lily, you want to come on over? This is Leslie James and Lily Balsitas. <laughs> I have Brayden Cook and Clay Reed with me, my two mathematicians. They are very competitive, so hopefully, <laughs> what do you think? Would that be okay? Would that be okay? Would you like to do that? All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All All right. What is this game called? All right. So, is he going to play? Sure. Okay. So, he's going to play. He's going to introduce to you the terms and over. They're all over. Okay. 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 Okay.
what happens so can you can I can't do does somebody go through and check them and make sure that your answers are the yeah, I was wondering if you
We had we moved it in as a pilot program in uh -huh. some of the classes uh, in the second half, probably February on okay. last year. So some have had some dabbling experience with it, but it. full implementation this year yeah. in 4K through grade five. And have, are we far enough into the school year yet that we've done testing on, um, you know, math tests and stuff like that? Are we seeing um, improved scores or improvements? Well, we've we've taken one like I ready one universal oh, screener so far, and that was just the baseline universal screener. So mm -hmm. in winter, we can take a peek at the I ready, you know, score to see how the yeah. you know obviously we move from map to I ready, so it's not going to be apples to apples when we're doing those right. types of comparisons. However, we will be able to see how much growth these kiddos are making, and yeah, in so my we're, person, we're no longer doing map testing. Is that? What I'm hearing you say? We've shifted to high okay. range the platform. Same concept. Yep. Just yeah. an updated yeah. universal screener. Got it. Platform. Yeah. So they'll be able to measure the growth of the fall to winter, like with yeah. the yeah. assessment. Okay. Um, last year with the pilot piece, they did have um, map data that they could look at winter to yeah. spring. Yeah. And ours was strong. <laughs> yep. It was strong. Our, our math map data was strong. Uh, West Side, second grade. Yeah. Strong. I would say, and this was probably a curriculum adoption that, huh. I mean, they always spent a lot of time going through the process and vetting it. I, I think it that. was, um, I would say, a, a more challenging one from my perspective because, I mean, I, you know, in, in sharing, because our math achievement is very high. Okay. And so one of the aspects and looking at it overall is wanting, if we're making a shift and our curriculum was updated, they weren't printing the materials anymore. It was kind of a yeah. mandated, like, okay, we yes. need to shift. Wanting to shift to something that was going to, you know, be an improvement on what we did have. And while our achievement was very high, there were also holes and gaps on mm -hmm. certain uh, students and learning that, it wasn't reaching it. So the, the whole team, I think, spent a lot of time, was very studious on it, looked at it. That's why they ran a couple of different pilots, like yep. which one is going to work better and so forth. So um, so yeah. on a whole, you guys are seeing um, a great yeah. grasp on concepts. It's the conceptual understanding. That's yeah. back that you, you said it. It's going from a procedure based, yep. you know, instruction to a conceptual deep dive yep. understanding the flexibility of thinking that these students can now show. And then we've got some of the high flyers in this room, let's be honest. Sure. The, the flexibility that they are now able to show in the way that they think, the multiple strategies that they're able to use and understand to show, you know, the understanding of a concept is incredible compared to what we were just talking about that today is is the way that they are able to look at a problem and decompose numbers in ways that they were never able to do before yes and do the mental math that is necessary we always talk in our class 
you're not going to walk down the street and see four plus five hanging in a store, right? Right. You have to understand the procedures, but you also have to understand the concept of how to apply those procedures. Yes. And that's what this is doing. So, in, in my opinion. Sure. <laughs> Anybody have any other questions? Oh, okay. Let's move on to the elementary school improvement plan. All right. I've asked um, this year and, and every year we the different teams in the grade levels, each school does a school improvement plan. And we historically in the past had always had them come and present those plans and those goals. And then we had done for a few years and we thought it would be good to go ahead and bring that back. And so first up, this board meeting is the elementary level. The next meeting will be the middle school and the high school level. And it'll just give an opportunity for the board to see what they're working on, what their focus is, and then um, ask any questions that you have related to it as well. We do ask in those school improvement plans, there's so many areas um, that they can focus and, and work on, but we do ask them to typically keep it to two to three um, important goals or, or areas of focus. And so I will go ahead and turn it over to the elementary team and maybe uh, maybe G, if you want to take points and introduce the team. Sure, sure. Well, I can tell you what, everyone will just introduce as they come up. We're, we're doing a, a shared presentation, although that is a hard group to follow. <laughs> they did a, a phenomenal job. And what I like best about that is it's always great to hear right from the teachers who are in the trenches daily to hear how the adoption and everything's going. And you're going to see that that is definitely a priority um, that rolls through our entire year. So um, this evening, we are excited to talk about um, our school improvement plan and how we're going to address both the academic as well as the social emotional needs for our K-5 students. So, and I'm blessed to be with a wonderful team of people that together we've got very high hopes as we do for each year. So goals for tonight, our brief presentation is going to highlight what are the big rocks at the elementary level for this school year. We're going to share uh, exact information on our school improvement plans. We have two goals that we'll share tonight. And then we're going to overview um, new and ongoing initiatives that will support those goals in our school improvement plan. All right, you have to understand Elk next to Big Rocks. This is amazing clip art feature. <laughs> Come on, right? This is Pretty awesome. Cool. The Sunday afternoon in August, as I was working on this for our teacher rollout, I'm like, this is it. This is it. <laughs> I also have pictures of Elk crossing a bridge, which goes with our bridges implementation. Uh, we have Elk swimming across water, which is fine if they fall off the bridge into water. We have a picture of an elk standing next to a bridge, which is not what we want. We don't want you <laughs> under the bridge and not doing the bridge. So we had lots of visuals to really drive this home. <laughs> here. So clearly one of our big rocks at the elementary level is our bridges implementation, which extends all the way down to 4K. So we even have this program now implemented in our 4K sites, working with them, professional development, all of the resources they've needed. Um, you heard a little bit tonight about the iReady assessment. <laughs> Similar to math, we just decided to move to a different testing system. And what we really like about this system is this system and the iLearning path, which is the individualized path, is created instantaneously after they finish their diagnostic assessment. So it creates a path that's at their level. What lessons are they ready for next in math and reading? Before, we had two separate systems that had to communicate. Um, Teachers at times had to go in and, and take out information and, and put in new lessons, and it, it just was very cumbersome, and the lessons were not as engaging for our students. Our students are really taking off with um, 
the new program. And in addition to that, and we can even do another follow-up on that, it can go through and a teacher can pull up a dashboard where it has cluster grouped the students who's ready for this concept, who's working perhaps at a lower level on this concept, and you can drill down and click and find lessons that are tailored. And those are face-to-face -face lessons. Those are not computer-generated lessons with the resources the teachers need to teach those concepts. Okay. So in addition to all what we have at Bridges, which is plenty to teach and utilize, teachers have that when we have to reteach a concept again and perhaps again. Yeah. Um, what was missing in the old system is it told us a list of what needed to be taught, and then you had to go and find how to teach it or, or look for that. We really like the just details and the um, supports that we can provide our students just by clicking in and, and finding those lessons right at our hands. We've probably heard a little bit about the Act 20 initiative. Mm -hmm. We have just completed our first round of uh, screening, assessment, diagnostics, met the 15-day window of testing, all first, second, and third graders in the district, getting the information out to parents, developing five-page individualized reading plans for the students who qualified for that. We are, we are rolling in the district, but that has been a big lift, particularly for our reading specialists and all of our teachers and administrators as we initiate that. We then also have enhanced social supports um, for our K-5, as well as just continuing to be in the top 10% that we do. But these are probably our, our main focuses this year. Knowing that this was gonna be a big year, I wanna compliment the school board again for modifying the calendar. We came back kind of again and again because we have Act 20 training that we'll be doing with all of our teachers, our admin team. In fact, Thursday, we're in our next session. We have six leadership full day trainings that we're going through prior to the teachers doing theirs. Um, that allowed us the chance to really give the professional development time to Bridges, our iReady launch, getting lots of things accomplished before in April, and then in June, we roll into the Act 20 component for the teacher education part of that. Here you'll see this was August. We had a phenomenal trainer. Um, he's featured here with Bridges. Teachers were in for a full eight hour day breaking ground and really learning some of the fundamentals, experiencing what some of the students would be going through as we deepened our own understanding of what does good math instruction look like and how do we deliver that in the district. So thank you to all of our elementary teachers for their time this summer. As Jason mentioned, there's, there's three um, documents that guide our work before we look at our data. The first is, again, the vision, top 10% in all we do. The second being our mission statement right behind the two of you over there or, or here. And then a few years ago, we developed what we consider our shared commitments. And we said, you know, the original R is reading, writing, and arithmetic, which doesn't even start with R, but it's known as one, are so obsolete. And so our district went back and rewrote that we have a focus on relationships, responsiveness, rigor, and relevance. And so when we write our goals, we need to select one of those to, to, to really drive that goal. And you're gonna see which two we selected this year at the elementary level. And those four were selected because they've been studied over and over again and found to be the most critical components to all of student achievement mm -hmm. in successful schools. So they're, interrelated from that aspect. Um, if you ever want to look up Hattie's work and John Hattie, who's done a meta-analysis of what's highly effective in schools and those areas have the big impact. Now, the wording might be a little tweaked because we wanted four R's for some reason. I don't know educators like. Rita went really rambunctious and tried to insert a fifth, and uh, that no, kind of really yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, evening. I'm Brian Frost. I'm principal at Tibbetts Elementary School, and uh, I've been tasked with sharing with you uh, how we decided upon our goals. And you'll hear me call them our goals. I know on the agenda, it's, uh, it's listed as the elementary school improvement plan. And for some of us, that's something you get put on. So yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it was nice of Jason to, uh, to explain, you know, that we, this is something in the process that we go through each and every year because we are continuously looking to improve our schools. And, and do better for our students. So, so our goals really, we, we start with our data. 
Um, and there is a great redefining ready dashboard that is created. Amy and, and her assistant works on, you know, digging through our data, helps us, asks us for, and, and it really comes down to the assessments that we've taken in the past, uh, which I'll talk to you a little bit about because, as we mentioned, that is changing a little bit this year. Uh, from there, once we have all of our data put together on that dashboard, we, we as principals take that data to our school leadership teams and really dig in and look at, you know, where we wanted to focus or what, you know, what we could have done better and what successes we can celebrate from, from the year past. Um, we also get our AVID site teams together and look at how we can incorporate our wicker and our strategies that we use for instruction to incorporate with those initiatives that we're, we're tackling. Uh, then we bring it all back to this team and talk about, you know, what each site kind of came together with and how we want to incorporate that as an elementary team moving forward with those goals. Uh, there's that picture of that um, redefining ready dashboard. And if you look at the left side, um, like I said, it's, it's focused on, in my opinion, the left side is really student achievement. Um, you know, it starts with math, math and reading on the far left, then the middle, it's how we did you know, on the board exam, math, reading, and if we're fourth grade science and social studies as well. The bottom is our, our Fountas and Pinnell running record reading levels. So again, all achievement pieces that, um, you know, are great. But then as, as Jason mentioned, you know, the, the achievement, sometimes we miss out on opportunities for all of our students to um, really demonstrate what they've learned. Because if you look at that lower right-hand corner, that's where we focus on the growth. So where we, we receive those students, you know, in September and where we can grow them to, you know, come May, June. Um, and that's, an, that, that's a piece that we can focus on all of our students with. And we've had high achievement. And of course we want all of our students to grow from where, where we receive them. So our, well, we're going to talk about that focus, and I think you've heard a little bit about our math tonight. Um, so that our, our first area of focus is going to be the math academic growth, um, both with that Bridges piece, because um, we've had high achievement and high growth with our previous uh, programming, and we want to continue that. Um, uh, can you back up one yeah, second, probably. Jason? That's okay. You got ahead of me. Um, the, the other piece of that, or the other goal that we're gonna look at is in self-regulation. We spend a lot of time and strategies on helping our students with their social emotional learning pieces. And uh, so that, that piece is really looking at our behaviors and that academic expectation as well. So that, that was our focus. And we decided math, like we said, with the, with the new curriculum, as well as I think the roadmap for reading, as Amy discussed with, with Act 20, is a little unknown at this point mm -hmm. and uh, a little bit different. So not that we're not uh, expecting great growth in reading. It's just our goal this year is going to focus on math. We'll probably look at reading in the next cycle. So, okay. Thank you. So to give some context, so when you're looking at these um, goals or these numbers, it's important from a statistical standpoint to understand what it's looking at. So like if you look at the math readiness, that's the percentage of students that are above the 65th percentile nationally. So anything at above 35% would be greater than the national average. Um, when you look at a growth target as well, when they set the growth target, it's they look at the students who scored at that level at that grade and the target set at the 50th percentile, right in the middle. So anything above 50%, you're exceeding that national average as well, just to give you some context. And uh, as you can imagine, once you hit around 70% 70, 70 of the students exceeding that growth target, that puts you, depending on the grade level, in that above the 90th percentile range nationally. Um, and if you're in those upper grade levels, it's actually closer to that 99th. Uh, percentile. It's a really high level when you get that percentage of students exceeding that, that average. All right, so I'm Tammy Fisher and I'm the principal at Jackson Elementary. Hi, and I'm Vince Lover, the assistant principal at Jackson Elementary. So our, our goal one is to increase student growth in the area of math at our elementary level. And the goal we have set is that 65% of our students will meet that year growth goal um, in grades K-5 um, 
and from fall to spring. And again, I know we had our meeting this morning with our leadership team and iReady is new and they're used to setting goals on map and I'm like, we can jump, we can do this. We, you know, this is what we have, let's see. So mm -hmm. we set it at 65% for um, all three buildings, which I think is a great goal. Next. So the ways we're gonna accomplish this is it's exciting to go into classrooms with Bridges number corner component which is done 20 minutes, at least 20 minutes daily in all of our K-5 classrooms. And you'll see kids around a calendar, around charts, and they're just talking math and doing all of that great discussion. Then Bridges core instruction program is 60 minutes a day. Um, and we're gonna, our goal is to go through one through seven units. There's one extra unit that they said, don't worry about in the first year. So our goal is to get through those one through seven in all grade levels, so with fidelity there. And they'll be doing direct instruction, they'll be doing their problems and investigation, the workplaces that the kids just showed you, mm -hmm. um, which are hands-on activities. Mm -hmm. Also the math committee that's been together, I think three years, um, you know, looking at math and what are, we, what are our deficits and where are our strengths. They'll continue to create tools and provide resources to enhance this district-wide implementation. So I went into a second grade room the other day and they had the slideshow on and it, the, it was going to a, a market and selling your beans. And are you going to sell all the beans for the same price if you have little beans and big beans? And just the conversation the kids were having, they were all down on their knees. They were measuring and they were, what could we use because we don't want to bring all these cubes to measure our beans. And just the deep conversations that we've seen already are amazing and exciting. So I think with this new adoption, we'll be seeing great student growth. All right. Um, students are also going to utilize our iReady. Um, by doing that, they're going to be doing about 30 minutes a week in both reading and math um, on their individualized learning paths. Uh, they're also going to use iReady resources to goal set. Uh, so the teachers will be conversing with the students individually come um, the winter test and will help the students set their individual goals. Um, we'll be utilizing the data from iReady and the workshop model um, to differentiate with small groups um, to help meet our, all our learners, you know, at and below and mm -hmm. above grade level. Uh, the, the math committee will be provided release time, which they've already begun, uh, to create curriculum resources for all of K-5 teachers, um, providing consistency in lessons taught at all three sites, uh, ongoing professional development in math, including opportunities to do peer observations. Uh, principals were just talking today about setting some more of this up for our teachers who are eager to go in and see each other do some of this work um, and compare notes. Um, and then our site PLCs and district grade level PLCs and the elementary admin team <clears throat> collaborate regularly regarding the math implement implementation to calibrate, celebrate successes, and share insights. Could you share what a PLC is? Uh, the professional learning community is where we meet as a team. A lot of times it's grade level teams or it's our leadership team, uh, really focused on student learning, student outcomes. We look at data, um, we look at instruction and how we can adjust to increase increase achievement. We also have vertical teams. So like grades three through five will meet just about math and then three, five will just meet about reading. So you really can see where, okay, third grade, you're doing this. Oh, fourth grade, you grow on that. Um, and just having, so that they understand the whole scope and sequence of our elementaries. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, I'm Ben Kuzlov, principal at Westside, and this is <laughs> I'm Cindy Lieberg, associate principal at Westside. And uh, we are tasked for introducing our second goal about uh, responsiveness. This is our responsive goal. Um, our elementary site teams will continue to enhance uh, our supportive services through PBIS programming, targeted behavioral interventions, to ensure that 88% is our goal of elementary students demonstrate appropriate behaviors as measured by receiving less than two uh, major behavior or referral infractions. Um, all three elementary school buildings, we have what's called either a major uh, referral or a minor referral, kind of depending on where they're at, uh, or the severity, I would say, um, of that kind of infraction. So 
a minor, the teachers deal with writing class is something that you can kind of redirect, deal with uh, the major and the folks that they have. Some extra fun, right? <laughs> uh, so just introducing a couple of different tools that we use here. Um, so first off, that we utilize AVID Classroom Culture Strategies to build connections. So basically what that means is team building activities, building relationships at that classroom level, um, doing different things that just build that community sense, I suppose, right? Um, where we know that that learning can take place um, in the best way possible because everybody is um, building those relationships together. And then um, you see Kelso's Choices on the left, that picture with a little frogs business mm -hmm. going on. Um, this is uh, discussed in guidance class and both in the classroom as well. Um, and Mrs. Hamlin, like in our building, she'll go through all the different ways that you can solve a problem, which is why it says it's your choice at the top. Um, and then she kind of teaches them how to apply those strategies in different situations, what well, might work best in one versus another one. Um, and then she teaches those K3, and then we're looking for the kids to to start really applying those in four or five on their own, even though the instruction fades away. Um, and then I know we talked about whole body listening. So for, especially for some of the youngers, what does that look like, right? Dry my eyes, ears, all of those things um, and building that success. So, and helping them regulate, right? Regulate their, um, their behaviors and then also just making positive choices. Uh, another, I guess, skill that we're trying to teach um, through the first 12 weeks, all K-5 um, teachers go through uh, the zones of regulation lessons, um, and that helps kind of students realize where how their body's feeling at the time. And you see in the upper right, there's the different colors that also go along with it. Underneath that is kind of the feelings that you might be in, right? We're in the green, we're ready to go, we're ready to learn. You know, if you're red, you're really not there. How can we regulate our body? And uh, we've also utilized different um, activities done by our sensory room, things like that. Hey, if we're in the red, these are some things that'll help you get back to the green and help kids. Um, and then they have daily check-ins. So again, in the bottom right, you see our free five often use a Google form right away. That's something they come in in the morning, check in, <clears throat> just can scan it like, hey, I need to check in with this kid. I can do it privately. I see something's going on. Uh, the younger kids will do more individual check-ins. Oftentimes they'll see some of these on the desk and they hey, this is where I'm at right now, especially if they're not quite at that age where they can kind of verbalize where they're at. But we do um, daily checks and utilize the zones of regulation through K-5. So this is how it's reported out to our parents, just so that we can be a team and making sure that the kids are self-regulating, ready to come in and learn and how important that is. So um, the elementary life ready expectations um, just includes that information regarding the individual student progress with that social development and self-directed learning. Um, and I know I've had lots of conversations with parents that just how important it is to come in ready to learn. And if kids struggle with that, um, we'll get into a little bit of how we help them support coming in with check in, check out systems or things like that. But just how important it is to team up with families on just how important it is that we're coming in ready and not having too much baggage being brought to their table, right? Try to keep it on their table and allow kids to be ready when they come into our doors. So that's just kind of how we stay in touch. And then also obviously that communication through conferences and through um, just us reiterating that as well through parent conversations. And I think it's important to make the correlation when you see this and, and as board members, because I see this out in the community or posted where certain titles or acronyms that we use come in and they go out with popularity, they can get demonized. For example, I've seen social emotional learning get demonized. The reality is when I was growing up in character education, it's workforce development, job skills. It's the same if you go up to the upper grade levels, we call it, they call it the expectations. It's really job force preparation. These are life skills that are important for people to have within the workforce, within every aspect. They're not truly um, controversial if people really dig in and look and say, okay, well, what is it that you're teaching? Be respectful, be responsible, be productive. They're critical skills that kids need to have. I think sometimes we do a disservice by retitling things and yeah. people think that it's something new yeah. that's never been done before. These are skills that have been taught, right. I would guess, since <laughs> formal education is right. taught. So. 
and even when we talk to parents just about how necessary all of these things are before you even get to the learning process, right? Or like within the learning process, like they have to have that foundation before they can be really successful with their learning. So. Another thing we do at all three buildings is um, we've really worked on beginning with like community circle, you can see that, right? Um, oftentimes a lot of the younger grades use that to start their day. I've also seen where if there's a behavior or something kind of happens that uh, outside at recess where they come in that classroom right away, we'll circle up the kids, kind of talk through it, problem solve, like uh, Mrs. Reber showed earlier, using those posters with the Kelso's choices. Um, and then they're also, also we'll use those for like problem solving just to practice the skills, right? What can we do? Um, another thing is we use like the mentoring program or positive role models, seeing that picture on the left, you know, again, building that community, um, I think that was twin day, but we also have like check in, check out uh, where uh, positive peers, staff will meet with the student right away in the morning. Hey, how you doing? How was your day? Hey, these are the three things we're going to work in. They go through their day. We get them at the end of the day too. They check out with them. Hey, I see you did a great job with this. Way to go. Keep it up. Write positive notes. Uh, goes home with their parents and goes back and forth. So set things up. So hopefully that they can kind of instill that intrinsic motivation to continue to uh, promote behaviors, right, that are necessary to be successful in school. And then just to add on to the circles really quick, I think it's just great for kids because they open up so well with those, especially when you're debriefing after maybe a student that struggles even in the classroom, whether it's outside or anywhere. But I feel like they're, they get to the point where then they're so much more willing to share with you what's bugging them, right, like mm -hmm. what's on their mind. And then again, get back to that learning space. It's also connected that I think those have become really great in our learning spaces. And we've also utilized, and I just want to share it to like front load, uh, uh, you know, for, for behavior for an assembly, like mm -hmm. we circle up, like, hey, what do you think would be? Or before like a fire drill, right? Our first fire drill, they circled up and they discussed what a fire drill is. Oh, I really hate the sound. You know, mm -hmm. what can we do if we really hate the sound? Things like that. So it's really been beneficial um, to build that community and just build that comfort. Yes. Um, with their emotions and learn from peers and they yep. learn so much from peers right um so yeah i was gonna say that that other one um so supporting the development of positive behavior and student regulation or self-regulation i know that we have been doing that work supporting emily lind amy g all of supporting us as well as building principles um and i think this first part of it the professional development being provided for um our school-based uh people like our counselors and our school psychs and it's becoming more differentiated to sort of what do you need? So, I, and which I love, right? And I think it's, we focus a lot on how to achieve student success, but also how to give practitioners what they need to be successful in their practice. And then they can give that back to kids. So I think we've been focusing on that really well with mental health um, and within our in-services and PD opportunities that that's been um in place really well, I think, and bringing in local people like PSG and some other entities where they can give um, their wisdom, you know, and their knowledge, um, because it's so focused in that area of mental health back to our practitioners here, and then we're able to support our kids better. Um, and then that's that second part, <laughs> continued PD um, provided for our paras and our support staff too, the neurosequential model um, regarding the trauma-informed care and de-escalating strategies early behavior interventions. So I know that part of that will be rolling out this year and um, having conversations with Emily as well, um, kind of looking at relate and regulate and then reason and how we really need to relate to kids first and build relationships and help them regulate when they're having difficulty. And then they're able to get to the reason part, which means like they can work through all of those processes, whether that's issues with friends and peers or whether that's the learning process that is becoming a little heavy for them. But just having that mindset and building our support staff knowledge as well, because they're like one-on-one -on -one with kids all the time. So I think that that's, um, that's awesome that we're taking the time to do that and have you through those PD opportunities. And the last one for the behavior is just our tier one level. Uh, all the buildings recognize um, our universal, right? right? We at Westside do the gotchas, uh, caught being the wildcat way, right? Being respectful, responsible, and safe. Um, they get so many gotchas. Then you can see our book cart there every Friday. We rattle off all the names, um, and they're able to choose a book um, on Friday. I know they do things similar at, at Jackson and Tibbetts. Um, as well as we have like the Paul for the entire class, right? If we get an entire class walking in uh, in the hall, 
you know, another uh, staff member may get that entire class of fall. We have reward systems for that, but continually reinforcing that positive behavior, the appropriate behavior, the expectations that we have for all of our students so that they're uh, at their best in order to learn and do well. So, that wraps up. Thanks to our elementary team. So just in summary, these are our two goals for the year. More details that we'll be updating. There is our uh, elementary SIP plan is linked in the, the slideshow if anyone wants to read further as to how that may look in a timeline. Um, you don't need to click on yep. the it's all there. And then one more slide. So thank you for your ongoing support as a school board and um, taking another peek at our initiatives for this year. Any any questions? This is probably the only meeting where all of us will be assembled here. <laughs> so, you guys know this format, sitting in a chair in front of people. Any questions you'd like to ask our team? I only taught high school and middle school. So I don't know. Your student self-regulation are, yeah. Um, are they honest? Yes. Yeah, I would say I would say yeah. yes. Um, I think so we do a nice job of. I, I would say especially our older kids. I think we do a nice job of setting it up universally from kindergarten on. Um, we spend so much time in the beginning of the year just establishing the the common language and the routine of doing it that it's surprising sometimes and refreshing how honest elementary students are. And sometimes kids can't say like I'm I got anxiety, yeah. but they can say I'm in yeah. the yellow. But that I think is a good starting yeah. point to be like, this is what my body feels like when I'm anxious, and that means I'm yellow. And then eventually you get to the verbiage where they can explain their emotions a little bit better. Oh, I think it's fabulous. Uh, I could see um, preventing problems that would occur later. That because they had been addressed at the beginning. I think it's fabulous. I just if you just got out of the car and you just had an argument with your mom, yeah. you are not in that right zone. And and sometimes just knowing that, like the teacher doesn't right. see him come out of the car, but he and I might get him out of the car and say, okay, it, it was a rough morning, mom was like late, they were yeah. eating breakfast in the car, you know, all those kinds of things where we can give each other those heads up. And and Kyle, I I taught at the high school level, but I have been an administrator at each level, and I would say all of our kids are honest. Sometimes it takes a little longer for them to get there. <laughs> <laughs> but with the elementary level, they're there pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, because because they want help and and they know that we're there to help. Well, I love that practice of them identifying every day. Right, like just that identification of this is how I'm feeling, and then that's how I might take in information differently, or right. So just helping them to navigate that, I think, is really nice. I know we have a kindergarten teacher here, and I would guess that there is a learning <laughs> curve, right, with the kindergartners going up the fifth. There's definitely a spectrum going in, like Mrs. Fisher said. You know, just teaching the kids what the emotions are, besides being happy, mad, and sad. Mm -hmm. Right, there's more to it. And I know our special ed department literally was working on taking pictures of, like, with student permission, but even pictures of the kids there so that they can relate to, oh, this is what it might look like to, in a real picture, right? Instead of like an emoji, like mad face, like this might, might be what I feel like. And they just make that face, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not when they're in action and angry, but just to help identify because sometimes they'll say, well, I'm in the green zone, but they just, you know, we're very angry so that they, you know, they might be where they want to be, but they can't always articulate it. So sometimes just using those pictures and things like that can really help. Do they have an opportunity to check in at a later point to, to redo that? So if they come in and they're anxious and they're, you know, not able to verbalize, but they're in that, you know, rushed and hurried and getting out the door and, you know, maybe a couple hours into the day, they're, right. Uh, ironically, I've been meeting this this yeah. afternoon, and we were talking about a student to his emotions, and and he was a kindergarten student, and, and I asked him, I call, you know, is, is he good with his check ins? And Miss Degner said, actually, he changes his emotion throughout the day on yeah, his own, as as he feels differently, you know, um, about what's what's happened. So a lot of the youngers have like a Velcro. Type yeah. of situation. Sometimes yeah. the teacher put it right on their desk 
and they'll just have the different colors and they can move around. That's all. Like move where they are, just so that then you have like a quick little visual, like, oh, how are you feeling? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's not a one time, you know, check in. It's, yeah. it's throughout Good. the day if, if their emotion changes. Well, yeah, and I would and I would hope that they, that it would that it would improve. Mm -hmm. I, I remember being on your side of the desk, and yeah, and uh, some tough kids that I dealt with over the course of time that I could see as the week went through and as the day went through. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 I think mine's pretty fluid. Some days. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <they all> <laughs> Hey, we have a number of you know ex experienced educators on this this team that have been in education, mm -hmm. you know, in the through a, a cycle in the last fifteen years. Which I think, you know, from my impression, there's been a lot that's happened with the innovation and technology, the smart devices. I know there's a lot of research coming out with that and the pandemic, and it does seem. And, and this has come up as a question. That's why I spoke to it earlier. You know, there's some people that will push for all schools to teach is reading, math, and, you know, writing. That's it. Just get back to the basics on that, that aspect. I guess what I'd like to ask is how critical do you see these outside influences having an impact on our children's development? And how critical is it to have this type of learning with that, do you see much of an impact in society and what we're dealing with in the last decade? And does it spill over into school and the student behaviors? Absolutely. Um, well, I I heard of 4K as well. And even kids reading a book, they're used to swiping. So they're ripping books. Like a simple thing like that, like because they're on tablets or they're on their mom's phone. So just turning the page is a new skill. Wow. That, I would have never read a book that way with little. I knew how to turn the page. So that as well as that immediate reward or gratification that you get from some of those games. I know Mr. Kitsar is having me do this dual lingual and I'm, I, you know, I want the star and I want the points and because I want to, you know, that I'm learning Spanish and um, just that immediate gratification, which we don't all have in every classroom. So you know, how can I get that intrinsic reward? Like, you know what? I did a great job. Teacher told me I did a, did a great job. I feel proud. I got that answer right. So I think we're battling a lot of that mm -hmm. and attention staying on because, you know, I mean, if you walk into anywhere, adults are on their phones, kids are on their phone, mm -hmm. um, to keep their attention, it's hard to do. It's different. It's different mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm just social media too, like how much that they, like I just talked with some girls today and, you know, some things that are on Snapchat and even though we can't control that, I like to at least have conversations with the kids so that they are not being affected within their learning environment and just so many things that are out there that, you know, come into play and then they come back to the classroom and even though that happened the night before or what have you, it's still sitting there with them. And are they really listening to their math lesson when they're thinking about so-and-so that snapped them that's sitting across this, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, it's hard and it's hard working through that with parents too, I think, and how they're just little. So maybe if oh, that's coming into play, oh, yes. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yep. Gosh. And it's just, it's it's difficult. And I, and I, I encourage any parents, like I would just delete it from their phones if it becomes an issue with, you know, their mental health and their, you know, school progress and things like that is just, they have so much more, right? Yeah. The good old days where we had less, it was really more. <laughs> yeah, I just really was. Bring it back to, you know, Jason yeah. had brought up John Hattie, and if you look at his research, uh, it is very important, right? That relationship has huge impact, especially with, with teachers and their peers. Then, you know, you go back to our expectations, right? And those are just like career and college readiness skills, right? It's not the right. four plus four type things. Right. And, you know, we've kind of discussed it, discussed it a little bit, but like that collaboration piece, you know, you saw that in the workplaces, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that Kelsey's choice, like being able to kind of figure out how do I deal with this problem? And oftentimes what I've seen, you know, that we're all dealing with when you have behaviors, like they're used to being like playing with each other, but you are all in your own home, right? You have your headset on. So if I want to, if I don't like what's going on, I just power off and I'm done with you. Yeah. Right. Or mm -hmm. I can send this little sneaky thing there. That's not helping any of our kids, you know, kind of grow and, and be ready and prepare for what we need out of the workforce. So, yeah. um, and I, I know you're involved, right? Building, you know, mm -hmm. all that stuff. I mean, that's the collaboration. That's the mm -hmm. stuff. And those are the jobs that are out there. Yeah. 
Um, so I think it is really important that we we do have a big challenge too. Yes, yeah. it's, it's changed a lot, right? Yeah. Just the way people are communicating and collaborating. So, so if you have kids who um, maybe have, you're seeing a pattern with the you know the red, yellow, green, um, and you're you're seeing a pattern with a, a couple of kids who are coming in every single day and they're red or yellow. Is that when you see those patterns, is that like a trigger call to the parent to say, hey, what's going on at home? What what can we do here? Or it sure can. Or, you know, a check-in with somebody, or we have what we call tier one, two or two, tier three meetings that are okay. twice a month. So it's kind of your frequent flyer kiddos that we then problem solve. Okay, could we hook them up with a mentor? You know, what does the family say they were need help with? Can we hack hook them up with a counselor that comes into our building from yeah. Credence or wherever? So we definitely, those are the kids that the red flag goes yeah. up to all the staff and that's yeah. where they bring their I mean, because it could be something as simple as the kids not getting breakfast or yeah. not getting fed enough or, you know, something that we can help with, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. We, we try to connect the families with as many resources as yeah. we can to help them. But at the end of the day, we try to control what we can control within yeah. the school day and, and provide that student with the safety and security that, yeah. that they'll get at school and the relationship with the person that they can trust. Yeah. Um, and really, the check-ins do really help because if a student is in the blue or the yellow or the red, mm -hmm. that does kind of trigger the teacher to check in with that student okay. and to make that connection and listen to what's going on. Yeah. Um, which then leads into all those other things. Yeah. Um, I do have one question um, about the responsiveness goal. Um, looking at this past year, we had 87% of students with less than, and, and then your goal this year is. Yeah, you can do it if you just keep going back. Oh, it's right there too. Oh, yeah, it's right there. Um, uh, this year is at 88, but back in 21, 22, we were at 90. Um, can I just ask you what what was the what was the reason behind the 88 percent goal? Why did you not go to 90? Or you know why are why are we only going up one percent? And that's an average, obviously, of our sure. three buildings. So we all have kind of different sure. numbers. Mm -hmm. um, I would say you know 87 is pretty high. I okay. mean we're 87% of our kids do not get a major infraction, more than more than two major yeah. infractions. That's that's pretty, I think that's pretty good. Okay. So I don't know if you can okay. become perfect in sure. behaviors. No, 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 Otherwise, no. we might not have jobs. Good. I don't know, but I think you know what I mean? You not. still have kids yeah. that okay. have mental or yeah. meltdowns. You still have kids that have trauma in their yeah. life. Yeah. I don't think you'll ever get there. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty think, proud of those numbers. Like. Okay. <laughs> I think the other another piece that you know in in the bus. Yeah. It's, it's, it's bus the bus. <laughs> bus reports <laughs> also the long test major. A little out of our <laughs> no, but we, we may have a lot. You know, but, but I would also say when you look at two out of 170 some days, like yeah. we, we do have maybe like little Ben and I I was eating on the bus. I write up okay, and that yeah. was September, mm -hmm. and then come January or done. Let's say February, March, mm -hmm. we just had a little party or someone, someone gave me a cupcake. I did on the bus, there's my second one. Yeah. So we do end up, you know, you take that into account and we do have a couple of, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily frequent flyers, but kids that yeah. might just get two out of our. We've, well, we've hey. seen some of our data points that they're, they've gotten to such a high point that it's hard to break through to that, like our co curricular participation at sure. 85%. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, those things where we're at yeah. such a high level, it's hard to break to that yep. next piece. But that's, that's, that's a well, very good sense. question. And I think it's yeah. a great question. And I also think it's so much out of record. It's so much of how they come in and the role models that sometimes kids are, right? Like yeah. viewing as often and, I, and we try to support as much as possible, yeah. but 
you no, know, exactly. Exactly. I'm just leading up to was going wondering why the why yeah. behind yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. with the number being already so high, yep. we wanted to make sure that it was something that was also attainable. Attainable. So. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Yeah. We'll be happy if it's 35. I'm trying to come back. The 90 could have landed on our year back from COVID, uh -huh. where we also had some students learning online. So we had a smaller population and okay. people were very leery and we had a lot of different sure. states restrictions going, you know what I'm saying? Sure. That we is didn't true. even have the same collaborative games going on where a dispute yep. could break out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's 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 like, that makes sense. <laughs> but they're not shouting out. As I think we'll be we'll be happy with it and hopefully we'll come in above 88 or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the bottom line goal. Is these are minimal. Same with the yeah. math goal. Yeah. We will reevaluate, possibly raise that after we see what the growth looks like from fall to winter on the new assessment. Well, I think that so. the fact that you guys have two brand new curriculums that you're dealing with in the same <laughs> year, yeah. you know, that's that's a lot. Yeah. Um, it is, it's a lot. I give a lot of credit to our admin team here. They're amazing to work with. Our elementary teachers are really mm -hmm. doing all they can this year. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of professional development, um, great positivity and support with our Act 20 initiatives that we've needed. In fact, our district reached out to Barb Novak, who is um, in charge of this Act 20 rollout with DPI. The, her nickname in the state is the Literacy Czar. Okay, so okay. she she took on this job, and thank goodness she did. But we've reached out to her, and she is willing to come down to Elkhorn and set up a meeting with our reading specialists and team to hear about what went really well, where we yeah. see value in the law, where the breaking points are, where things need to be revisited from just, here's a district with multiple reading specialists, here's here's where we're just inundated and yeah. can't keep up. And we are a district that has a strong multi-level systems of support. Mm -hmm. um, we're vying for, if kids are at the 70th percentile, please don't make us reassess them two more times throughout the yeah. year. This is a waste of time and energy. Like what, what little shifts can we make? Yeah. As I said to Jason, the ship sailed on this. Mm -hmm. If we can grab the helm and steer a little bit sure. with our mm -hmm. input and data and yeah. things we can share, um, we'd like to do that because a lot of districts have sat back and have not rolled on this because legally they don't have to till yeah. January. Right. So now we're fielding phone calls. How do you do this? What did you do? Wow. We, don't, we don't have a lot of time to guide everyone. And yeah. Yeah. as I said, it's we'll send you a PDF, but we're not sending you the Google Doc. You got to yeah. you gotta put in some time here, but we're yeah. we're helping and fielding questions, but we'd rather do that at the state level. Sure. And so we've got some meetings set up. And Good. yeah, I'm just we're excited about that. All right. yeah. I think one of our challenges, and, and it's related to this as well, is the screener tool that they use is a names web. They basically... Mm -hmm read a, a reading passage, which it, it's a tool that's been around for a while, but it has a what's called a very high standard of error. It, it really, um, because it's that, that one screener, and until you do multiple of them, you don't really dial in on how well the student's really doing. And so it did flag, you know, a lot of kids got flagged on that initially. And so it was a lot of work in developing these reading plans and so sure. forth, because based on that one, you know, assessment, which is wildly, I don't want to say inaccurate, but the accuracy can really vary depending on what is the reading passage. Do they have background knowledge on that mm -hmm. subject or that content area? Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's a lot of work and perhaps a lot of kids in that screening or with that reading plan that, to be frank, really don't need it and we'll probably test out of it as they have more sure. you know screeners administered but it is what it is yeah okay all right thank you all very much thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. good work yeah okay we're at the eight the approval of the school board comes from October 14th. Uh, does anybody have any comments or changes that need to be made? If not, looking for a motion to approve. Hi. Go to your board now. Yeah. I move to uh, <laughs> the yeah. 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 October 14th, 2018, for a regular session, school board meeting, and the assembly. 
October 7th. I am happy. I moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the October 14th regular session school board meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, she passes. Uh, next item is the general and other fund bills. Yeah, general other fund bills this evening covers checks number 153, 378 through 153, 532, wire transfers number 446, in ACH checks numbers 234, 281, the combined amount of $1,256,312.97. I provided a memo with some additional information on several of the bills in the board packet. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Truen? I'm assuming Purple Communication Inc. is an ASL uh, trans or interpreter. Yes. It's an yes. interpreter. Yes. For yes. student. Yes. Emily. Yeah. Yeah. Emily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, how, how do we pay them? We pay them for the hour, or do we have like a contract with them? It it's both. I mean, it is a contract. It's contracted per hour. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I'm assuming that there was a project lead the way conference yes. that yes people had to travel for. Okay, that explains. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, several hundreds of dollars in luggage fees. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I um, think there were five people that went. Yeah. And then BSS yeah. Sports Girls Basketball Backpacks. That's what it was. $2,800 oh. for backpacks? That was the description. Yeah. I, I'm understanding of that, but it's. How many kids were? I mean, that seems like a lot of money for backpacks. So I'm just curious what that was. Is this. Is, is that something that the kids paid for? Yeah. Is that a fund 21? Yeah. Yeah. So it would have been a fundraiser. Oh, okay. So they would have used yeah. fundraising funds for it. Yeah. Okay. I know it's a okay. fundraiser because there's no sport that has a $2,800 budget. Yeah. They have the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And just, anytime they <clears throat> have expenditures like that, they and they can't pay for something, they usually go to. Right. Um, and, and that's a booster fine, but not knowing what all the different yeah. funds are and how different yeah. things it's are still. a really good question, but if you see a 21 in front of something, then yeah. it's either funded through fundraising or other donations. Yep. So, okay. yeah. It looks to see it. <laughs> but good question. Yeah. I, I just, again, just thought it was out. Where would I see the 21 if it's on? Okay. Hold on. Any other questions? Yeah, I would guess the equipment bags probably run at least 50 bucks a piece, uh -huh. or 80 bucks. And yep. if you're talking 50 of them. Depends on what equipment, that. like swim backpacks are more expensive because you have to have the dirty pocket. I mean, yeah, just the wet pocket. Yep. So this is a good idea. Yeah, you know. So, um, yeah, Bill, on these reports, I'm not, it's not listing the fund that it's coming out of. Is that from a credit card purchase or? No, it's so. No. Uh, on page 20, I don't know, of the, of the um, bills uh, attachment. I think it might just be the. I mean, it's fine. I, I mean, I understand the explanation. I'm just, again. Um, yeah. Yeah, what I can do. A year, a year in, and I, the learning curve is still there. No, no, that's good. Yeah. There's another report I can run that I have the string of account numbers, and then, but I, I don't, just don't know how don't helpful that would be. It. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. I, it's it's a reasonable expect uh, explanation. I get it. Not a problem. I I just mm -hmm. yeah, things I have learned to ask about. <laughs> yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. There are no other questions. Then looking for a motion to approve. I move to approve the general and other fund bills of October 28, 2024. Check number is 153378 to 153532. 
Uh, wire number 446 and the ACH number is 234 to 281 and the combined amount of $1,256,312.97 as presented. Is there a second? I'll second it. So I moved and seconded to approve the general and other fund bills of October 28th, 2024. Check numbers 153378 to 153532. Wire number 446 and ACH numbers 234 to 281 in the combined amount of $1,256,312.97. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. All right. The adoption of the 2024 2025 district budget. This evening, the school board's being asked to consider approving the, uh, actually adopting the 2024 25 budget. Um, which is being presented this evening. Um, and a couple of things here. You may recall you approved a budget, which was a preliminary budget back in June. And at that time, there's a couple of detailed information we don't know. We can't calculate our revenue cap because we don't have our third Friday counts yet. We don't know what our state aids are, nor do we have our equalization uh, values for the school district. You may recall at the last meeting, we talked a little bit about our student enrollment because we had those figures as well. And then our property values went up about 7.3%. So we were waiting for our state aid number, which was actually going to be known the very next day. So we got that figure. The good news is it went up about $200,000. So, um, and, and much of that seems to be as a result of the redistribution of MPS's situation, um, which affected all school districts across the state. So, so that's the good news. Um, if you go to, I think, page four, Jason, I kind of highlighted any additional changes. So that's the additional equalization aid. We have some final ESSER funds that we'll have to spend by December and they've been encumbered through September. So we'll close out those ESSER funds, the remaining balance. Um, the other big change is the voucher A deduction went up another $152,000. So that is over $670,000, which gets added into our annual tax levy. Mm -hmm. And that was created back in 2015-16 um, as part of that legislation. So, so that has a reverse impact in terms of yeah. um, the overall levy. Um, but at the end, when you look at our tax rate mill rate, we're actually going to be seeing a decrease of about 31 cents per thousand. Um, so it would go from 6.81 um, down to 650. Yep. And then without the referendum. Without the referendum, then even with the referendum, it would be lower in terms of the um, actual mill rate than the goes down to 10, 10 yep. cents. So so those are the, I guess, the highlights. Um, what follows that page, then if you kind of scroll through, Jason. I just want to add, this is an area that I do anticipate in this biennium budget, the state perhaps putting more money. It's very unpopular the way it's currently set up where all the voucher payment goes on the local levy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the state basically reduces the aid they would have given you, and then you have to increase your local money. So I anticipate them doing something to offset that a little bit, which will lower local levies. Won't give us any money, right? but it will lower the local levy tax burden, perhaps. So the following pages is the calculation of our revenue cap. Um, and there's a couple of numbers on the right side here I just wanted to highlight. Because we're in a declining um, enrollment, we have what's called a whole harmless ex exception. So that's at 700. You mean a resident declining enrollment? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the resident number. Um, so that impacts in terms of our overall revenue cap. So it, basically what it does is it doesn't reduce us by that amount immediately. It begins to kind of ease the drop because of our resident enrollment going down. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see the voucher aid deduction there, which is line I of age. And, and what's kind of difficult is we don't have any idea what that number is going to be until we get our state aid number on October 15th. Mm -hmm. When you go back to the DPI resources, the only thing I can tell you is there's about 62 students that qualify for that. Mm -hmm. And they may be going one to eight different um, 
-hmm. charter schools within Walworth County. Mm -hmm. So um, they can go to charters outside of the county as well. They can because it's mm -hmm. Wisconsin. Yeah. yeah, it could be anyone, right? Mm -hmm. But there are eight within Walworth County mm -hmm. that qualifies charter. So, so that's the calculation in terms of um, our revenue cap calculation. And then what follows that is the um, actual funds for the school district, starting with general fund and includes then the budget for 2024-25. That first number of purple, I highlighted to include what our actual fund balance is for starting the school year, which would have been our Indian balance from last year. Mm -hmm. I've already had a chance to look at our draft um, audit statements, and you'll probably be seeing those either the next or the following one. And then the actual revenues then and, and expenses for our general fund is what follows below that. Then below that would be um, all the other funds would follow. So that would be fund 21 would be the next one. And then 27, which is our special education fund. And then our debt service fund. That's the special ed. And then fund 30 would be the debt service. And then fund 40, you may recall 46 is where we're putting some of the monies we collect for our community service fund into that mm -hmm. fund for um, future um, maintenance projects at the district. And then um, the Booster Club is still paying off the uh, improvements they made over on the, the football field entrance area. And then our food service fund is fund 50. We have a separate fund for that because it's a federal program. Our community service fund would be fund 80. And then our package or co-op program would be our CCA program and any grants associated with that because Williams Bay is part of that program as well. So we have that as a co-op and we fund that through fund 90. So those are the budget figures um, for all of our funds. And then what follows that, um, is our debt service um, in terms of our actual long-term debt. And by doing the payments that we did this year um, and paid off some of our debt early along with the regular payments, our outstanding debt right now is about $30 million. And with the three issues originally, it was about 50 million. So we've actually paid off about 40% of our long-term debt That's already. Great. And as a reference, I wanted to include what the tax levy information looked like back in June. And without the operational referendum, the increase was about 2.42%. And with the referendum was 5.75. And then we assumed a 2% increase in valuation to reflect new um, market growth. The, the impact was about three cents on our uh, non um, operational referendum scenario, and then with the operational referendum, it's 25 cents per thousand. Mm -hmm. And then if you go forward on to the October, um, the actual levy amounts are exactly the same. So the only thing that's changed is the mill rate because the valuation actually went up 7.33% rather than 2%, mm -hmm. which technically lowers the mill rate, but mm -hmm. I think a good chunk of that, other than that 2%, is probably simply market adjustments. Mm -hmm. So you can't assume by simply having a lower mill rate means it's lower taxes. Right. I think we've been conservative on that. Right. So. Do you see, because the resident declining enrollment is not just affecting Elkhorn, but it's across the state, um, there's just about every community across the state is dealing with a resident declining enrollment for many reasons. Um, do you see the state ever, because right now that, you know, it helps us a little bit, but it, eventually it's not gonna help us at all. It's gonna hurt us, right? In terms of revenue, yeah. yes. 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 So do um, you see the state dealing with that issue and how, how they calculate that? 
I I think they would probably say they've already have a system in place to the hold harmless because it, it gives you time to adjust accordingly. It doesn't take you okay. right away. Okay. Um, is there any other state action? Sometimes there's discussion about legislation for declining enrollments, yeah. but I haven't seen any. I don't, Jason, have you seen anything that's concrete that you can? No, not yet. It, it's something when our revenue limit formula was put in place, it's I'd say pretty unique to Wisconsin as compared mm -hmm. to our surrounding neighbors because they don't go down in their budgets as right. their enrollment decreases. Right. Um, I think it's something to push forward because the legislators get beat up within their own communities because right. it is strangling yep. the financial resource. And it also creates a scenario where they can't easily fix it. That's why right. um, like Senator Nass's office when he's been reached out to, it'll say, yeah, it's a tricky scenario. They can't go and say, for example, to close Elkhorn's Gap, we're going to increase the revenue limit $2,000 per pupil. Right. Um, because that would break the state budget as you right. would increase everybody's revenue limit by that amount in districts who don't right. need that. So right. it, um, I, I would say the most likely scenario would be is if you could get the state to just drop it from this day forward, it can't fall below that student count, but you're at least getting that minimum student count number. Right. I don't know if they would do it or if they modify it out to where it's a 10 year average on the downside or something. There's things they can do to sure. repair that from yeah. having an impact, but I haven't heard any chatter or momentum on that. No. Okay. And I think what, what Jason said is so true. It, it's always difficult for the state to make any significant changes in school finance without having winners and losers. Yeah. In that scenario. True. So, usually, if you look back in the history of school finance, the only time that's happened is when the state's been in a situation that they can put something in place where it doesn't hurt anyone and then helps those that yeah. they want to help, so to speak. So, um, mm -hmm. And that's why I've heard them talk about, well, special education, we can increase that funding. But I've also heard uh, reports that, like, you know, Robin Voss pointed out that they don't want to increase what's called a maintenance of effort. Because as you increase special education funding, you're then obligated to maintain that level um, unless you can demonstrate why the reduction is, you know, taking place, that that needs no longer there. And I think there's some hesitancy to commit to that high level of funding from a federal statutory standpoint. Mm -hmm. So okay. I don't know. It, it's an area, I think that's an area to push and, and lobby for though, is mm -hmm. to have a fix where you're not penalizing the districts in that declining enrollment. Because I've shared the example online that even though our resident enrollment dropped 72 students last year, you divide it, we talked about it at the meeting right. from that question, you divide it amongst 14 grades, it's five kids per grade. Right. What do you, nine sections per grade, what do you you know, eliminate to make up that loss of a million dollars in revenue that will eventually fall off the books mm -hmm. when it's spread apart like that? Mm -hmm. it's, so it's a challenge for schools to mitigate that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the last couple of pages shows the distribution of the levy across the different municipalities and on both scenarios in terms of with the referendum and without. So you can kind of see how the dollars actually get allocated. And this is based on equalized value. So the assignment for each municipality is based on equalized value. Then the distribution within the municipality is based on assessed. So that's the two part calculation. So you can kind of see how the numbers um, change based on the change within the equalized value of each municipality and then how that affects the actual tax level distribution. So if the average is 7.33, the closer you are to average, you kind of get a sense of that's probably going to be the average impact for that municipality. But if there is an increase significantly more compared to another one, yeah. it does affect the distribution. And see how that works. And then I think the last page, I, I just went back and, and I thought it was, I wanted to see how our overall tax levy um, between the different funds has changed over time. So I went back 20 years. 
And in 2004 5, our debt service was about 23%. Our community service was 1%. And the general fund level rate was 76%. If you look at it today, this does not include the referendum. Debt service is 22, communities three, and the general fund about 75. Yeah. So even in 2004 or five, I think our, our debt load at that time was about 30 million. And that mm -hmm. included the new middle school, the high school edition, which was done back in the late 90s, mm -hmm. and then the Tibbetts edition done in the 95. Mm -hmm. So now it's kind of different this time because of the timing. Um, with the referendum is the board would need to not only adopt the budget, but then the certification would include two different levies amount depending on the referendum. Right. So should we, we have to adopt both because we don't well, know. Can, can, can the yes. Yeah. <laughs> and we, and we can't and just, and we can't just postpone this. No, nope. the next meeting. No, because nope. we'll have to get the tax levy certifications out yep. to the municipalities. Oh, it has to be done yeah. in October. It's right? a timing thing, yes. Yeah. So, first off, we need the motion related to the adoption of the budget yes. and the two separate motions on the certification. Correct. Right. Yeah. So, there's yeah. three motions that we yeah. have to do. Yeah. yeah. So, I'll move to adopt the 2024 2025 district budget as presented. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the 2024-2025 district budget as presented. Um, do we have to do a roll call on this? Is this, or can we do voice vote? You can do a voice vote. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, looking for a motion to approve the levy, including the referendum. I move to approve the 2024-2025 tax levy, including the operational referendum in the amount of $23,666,340 as presented. I'll second. So moved and seconded to approve the 2024-2025 tax levy, including the operational referendum in the amount of $23,666,340 as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And another motion. I move to approve the 2024-25 tax levy, not including the operational referendum in the amount of $22,921,728 as presented. So second. I'll second it. Um, it's been moved and seconded to approve the 2024-2025 tax levy, not including the operational referendum in the amount of $22,921,728. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. And now we are finally to <laughs> <laughs> get a report. Rob. Really get past the yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, over at the high school on the top left, there's a flyer for trick or treat night. That's coming up this Wednesday from four to seven. So all of the elementary schools are looking forward to that. All of the clubs are kind of preparing for everything that they're going to do. And then student council is also doing something new this year with that. So um, the elementary school part is from four to seven, and then we're going to do a high school haunted house hour from seven to eight. So we're extending it that hour for the high school. Um, so that's something new that we're all really looking forward to. Um, and then uh, the football team over there made it to playoffs. They just won against Monroe, and now they're going to their second game this Friday against Milton. Um, Lauren, uh, Peyton, and Alexandria all competed at State. Um, Alex won her first match, and then she fell short in her second. Is this for tennis? Yes. Um, and then on the top right, I have a picture of soccer from their senior night, and then soccer also made it um, – Past their conference and they just won their regional match or game and then they're playing again Thursday. And then I have a picture of Haley. She's stayed down for cross country and then she also nice. made first team all conference at conference. Oh, that sounds great. What's the time? Um, over at the middle school, Miss Card won the outstanding teacher award for PLTW. 
And then wrestling and gymnastics will start today. And then uh, the seventh and eighth grade band um, had their ball program this past week. Uh, so at Jackson, Matt Wilhelm uh, went to visit and they got a cool poster, Matt Wilhelm posters there. Uh, in the middle, students entered uh, conscious slips for uh, good deeds, uh, respect, responsibility, and good living. So each week, what they do is that uh, they select names, uh, and then uh, those kids get to choose a book from the book writing machine in Jackson. And in the bottom right, uh, that's third grade students students building simple machines, and then a picture from the trick or treat day. So, uh, so it's Red Ribbon Week. Uh, today was Future Day over at West Side. And so they're gonna be participating in that all week. All the way to the right is uh, Mrs. Sanchez's homeroom. Um, kids showing off their personal narrative stories and then kids just in gym class. In the Over at Tibbetts, uh, the fourth grade went to visit uh, Madison, the capital. Uh, that was the 22nd. So those, those were the two, first two pictures. Um, it's them at Madison. And then the, there was a pumpkin investigation in Miss Lewandowski's first grade. <laughs> um, over at options, the picture on the top left and then the top middle, those are um like owl mosaics that their art classes are learning to make. So they're taking different like pieces of poetry and different fabrics and textured items to make a picture of an owl. And then at the bottom left and bottom middle are pictures from their fall fun night. So all the kids came um, dressed up in Halloween costumes and then there were bouncy houses and other little fall activities for them to, to do. The top right is a picture of their lower elementary school kids learning how to draw their alphabet in shaving cream. <laughs> and then I just went. <laughs> and then the bottom right is a picture of middle school kids um, learning about the digestive system. So they put like saltine crackers in bags and then water to watch how it like decomposes in the oh. same way that it would in your digestive tract. <laughs> <laughs> Over at CCA in the left, that's um part of the youth build project. And so some of the middle school kids, they kind of showed them what they were doing and how to like how they were building it. And then the other pictures are all from this um, event that they had where a bunch of different professions in the trade came and all the kids got to work hands on with um, the different skills that each of the companies do. So the, the Adams Family Musical at the high school, the tickets have just started uh, being sold. So the days are uh, Friday, November 15th, and then Saturday the 16th. Uh, they both start at 7 p.m. Uh, tickets for adults are $7 and for students are $5. Uh, and then in the middle is the uh, chemistry and cauldrons with Miss Esther during uh, the family story time. And then uh, all the way on the right, it's just another another reminder for the trick or treat night. It's going to be super cool and fun. Everyone should go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to sound like an old man. <laughs> Who's Matt Williams? I was, yeah, I was wondering the same thing. It was a BMX bike. So oh. he was on. He does like a BMX bike show. Okay. And I set those up for Jackson and Westside. And he's pretty cool about incorporating anti bullying messages because oh. he was bullied as a kid, I suppose. Okay. And he said that he, um, you know, kind of like just integrates it really well. He does some yeah. cool tricks and he said that he kind of like went through that outlet to, you know, find some fun and excitement in his life and yeah. kind of steer in a different direction. It's a pretty cool guy. He does it like all around the nation, different shows. Cool. Nice. Well, so I'm sure the kids know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they they were so excited about those posters. We got like 10 and it was like every kid. How do we get a poster? Yeah. <laughs> so we did some giveaways throughout the different weeks after he was there. That's fun. Yeah, he's he's pretty amazing. Okay. Um, next is the referendum update. Right, we had the community meeting and you know that was streamed online and then Watch virtually. We probably have, you know, want to thank those that came in person and thank the board members for their time. I uh, heard a lot of positive feedback in that regard. And I think we had, you know, more people that watched it online or, or did so afterwards. Um, I think we have one more meeting. The last employee group or staff group is uh, will meet with the bus drivers tomorrow. Thank them for their service, but also then give them the informational presentation and otherwise we met with all of the staff. Um, I believe all of our community meetings that we've been invited to were completed. We met with the uh, card club on uh, last Thursday. 
Or was that Thursday? Yeah. yeah. Uh, lots of members of the card club that don't live in Elkhorn. They come from all over uh, Lake Geneva, Delvin, and so forth. So, um, yeah, we want to thank all of those different groups that invited us to come and give them information about the upcoming referendum. Anything you'd add, Bill, on that? Or? No, thank you. No? All right. All Get right. out and vote. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, first reading of the revised 331 district curriculum policy. Okay. This was policy. The policy committee actually reviewed this, I believe, at the beginning of the summer and then. Uh, it just slipped through the crack and being brought forward to the board. So we reviewed it again at the policy committee meeting and is bring, we're bringing it forward for a first reading. The um, significant change is on the curriculum council that was established last year will be shifting from uh, one parent in each of the grade spans to two to have more parental involvement on the mm -hmm. curriculum council. Mm -hmm. And language associated with that and then some added language related to the um, any budget and our staffing implications just as a added as part of that course proposal component this was the major part here yeah and then adding in the reconsideration of instructional materials, that was a policy that we modified. Well, we're actually in the process of modifying the instructional material one. The uh, library it used to be just instructional materials, now we're breaking out to the library books and instructional materials were two okay. separate policies. Yeah. So updating that language. Any questions? When did when did we start the just the curriculum council? Was that about this time last year? Last fall was the first meeting. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so if the are the terms for one year? Two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. They're two two years. Okay. Yeah. Is that stated? So this would be good. Um, yeah, I believe that was stated in there. Okay. Let's double check. That would be good because we have one group that was appointed and then so that would get a cycle well, adding reason, that second group. The reason I ask that is because it says parent representatives may serve for two consecutive years. So that would indicate to me that it's an annual appointment. Because um, it says the curriculum council will annually appoint parent representatives from each level. So are the parents serving different terms than the rest of the council? I don't know that it says for the rest, you know, the where, term for the rest of the council at the top of the page. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I'm not seeing where it says where the terms are of everybody else other than parents. Right. So we, I think we need to better define that. The term. Mm -hmm. uh, because right now it's defining the parent representatives. So well, the right. others are appointed. Two board members who are appointed in the regular construction of I think it. I think the parents there would set up that they would be on it for two consecutive years. So is that is two consecutive years one term or is that two terms? I think we interpreted that to be one term. What term? One two term years to be one term because that's not the way it reads. We should change the language. Yeah, it needs to be yep. better defined. That needs to, the language on that piece. Because yeah. then the last sentence is parent representatives may serve for two consecutive, consecutive years. years. That three change will also make. So if the term is two years, that last sentence parent doesn't make sense. Oh, so the or worth one if they could re, re, re up. Is the term is like, one year because it says in the annual. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. Year. Year. Second year. Right. But the most they can do is two years. Right. Is that how is that how you're interpreting it? Yes, Julia? that's how I'm interpreting okay. it. Yeah. How it currently reads. But my question is, it does not say how long a term is for. It just the, says eight. 
commissioned by it. Okay, who are so appointed, appointed annually. annually. So it looks like everybody's term is one year. Is that my correct? Yes, and there's no limit on how long the others could be appointed. And that's to, fine. Yeah. yeah. But my question is why does it have to be consecutive? I could be a parent and I could I could serve my so for a year. And then five years later I could come back. Right. Right, right. Why does it have to be consecutive? I think I think it's saying they serve it eight. should say yeah. up to. Well, then there may be some of the parents that do they have to still remain within that grade span. Oh, right. And that's true. Because if they're a 912 parent and they had a senior last year and they no longer have a senior, are they still right. eligible mm -hmm. or? Right. No. Or they have a K-5, they have a fifth grade. I mean, it, to be frank, it seems like a lot of work to reappoint for something that we need three to four times a year. I, I would agree. But I do understand your point as well. You know, so I think we kind of need to take a closer look at the but wording and yeah, how is, yeah. is there a way to just tidy it up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to maybe look at it and make some? I guess the intent are we wanting it that they can serve two years in a row and then they're, then they're done. Then right. they're done. Yeah. Okay. And all right. Then we can bring some suggestions back on that. Uh, are we okay with the language and the others? To be frank, on the others, it's it's more um, from the principal standpoint. You know who's willing or available, or because I've got to find somebody within each of those correct segments. I didn't have anybody wanting to duke it out over the slide. Right, <laughs> but but it looks like the rest of the members are also annually appointed. Right, which would be like the board committees. That's probably why yep. that language is there because yep. each year the board president reappoints the correct. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think we just need to clean up that language a little bit more. All right, we'll see if we can get some <laughs> language draft to the prevent period. Watching you live. And <laughs> <that's> not... <laughs> I, know, I know, it's just really odd to see okay. my, the mouse and stuff moving on my screen. <laughs> All right. So we'll bring that back and see if we have some yeah. clarity for it. Okay. Um, do we want to go to the next one? Or any more discussion on this one? Yeah, I didn't have anything else, but unless somebody else does. Right. Uh, the next one is the revised professional staff employee handbook. Uh, we are requested to look at um, some of the different co-curricular positions, and in particular with the middle school, and bring them in alignment with the amount of weeks that their different events work and so forth. And so this is a portion of the employee handbook that um, in blue would identify the changes to that. And because it's part of the handbook, we need to bring that to the board for approval on the recommended changes and uh, so through the personnel committee. Uh, they're not significant changes, but it brings it in line with uh, the length of the middle school seasons, which have changed from when they were originally put in. Mm -hmm. So at the middle school, we have volleyball and volleyball intramurals. Yeah, it's, it's such okay. a huge Got it. number of student participants. They can't, and you know, we don't, um, we have a no cut policy, which means an inverse, right. means that we find a place for all students to participate in. It. Right. So, but it doesn't mean that there's not an A team and a B team or a C team. So, there's the intramural portion as well, so the students can still participate. Got it. And we're no the football and football coordinator positions went away because that's all falls under youth football now. Is that? Uh, yeah, we have a volunteer that covers that. Oh. It's toward the bottom. Where is it at? It's right there. there. Right there. In that. In that um, one. Yeah. So. Um, I do this. I volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Sorry. For now, that's bad. not me. Sorry. <laughs> What's that? I'd still be there if it's my back. <laughs> yeah. So that's not needed. We used yeah. to have that as a paid position. So. Yeah. Okay. Might need to come back as a paid position. <laughs> <laughs> Get your point where you want to stop. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes, that's why I meant that. <laughs> right. So no action needs to be taken because those are just first reading. Yes, right. Go. And I was at this personal meeting and I was astonished to learn that we what was the percentage with 85% of our kids involved mm -hmm. in extracurricular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's great. That's fantastic. Yeah, when we started with the reading, finding ready initiative, and that's where sometimes you can't see that growth anymore because our chart doesn't extend. Yeah. It was 51%. Wow. Uh, participation co-curricular. So and that was an area of focus, but now we get that where we're like low to mid 80s. And so if it's, we're not seeing how to break sure, that. Sure, right. That we're not support. We're not because support. you kind of reach that maximum of how many kids are realistically going to participate. Right. And, but but still reevaluating yeah. programs that, oh, maybe they're tapering off and maybe right. there's interest yeah. in another area. Yep. So we need to have growth here and let's right. close this one out and that kind of yeah. thing. So, yeah. I heard from Miss um, Card that she has so many students wanting to be in the STEM club that mm -hmm. she can't take them all. Like there's, she needs help. <laughs> yeah. Like she, it's she's overwhelmed by how many kids want to be in the STEM club. And that's something we've always expanded or given that green light, assuming there's the people willing to mm -hmm. work in that area. Because as you saw, the, the stipends aren't no. substantial, and so we've always added in those areas to accommodate kids because we don't want them to miss the options as much as possible. Sometimes we have had to do a waiting list on some of those sure. type of activities and rotation. I know at the elementary level when we we had the STEM club there in the past as well, we've had to do that and rotate. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Which is awesome that we have that much yeah. interest. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, personnel recommendations. Hey, there were, here's our personnel sheet. Um, Caitlin Blatter, who's worked with us as a social worker. She was our first social worker that came to us in partnership with the county. And then she took a position in the district. She has um, accepted a position at, at the state level um, that she's going to be working with them. We hate to see her go. She's been a great asset. And I know she's a big supporter of the district, but I completely you know, understand the opportunity that she had and, uh, for her family. And so wish her the best. And Kristen Mariano is, as well had a opportunity. Kristen's been with us oh, nine years, I believe. And um, her home district contacted her and offered her a position. So I, um, you know, completely understand her need to get closer to home and wish her the best. And that I want to thank both of them for their, their service. They've been wonderful to work with over the years. Um, we have the resignation from um, Damila Craver and Marissa Wallace as well. Wish them the best as they move forward. And we have transfers of Leah Holdley, um, who was on um, over at West side originally, she's gonna go over to the middle school to fill one of the special education openings that we had. Uh, Jody Baumeister is um, going over to the special education teaching assistant and Gilberto Huerta Garcia um, is a high school custodian over to the high school. And then we have the appointment of Laura Ellsworth. She was filling in on a paternity leave in that position at Westside and been doing a fantastic job in, in that slot that Leah Oldling was in. And so it kind of worked out with the um, resignation that we'd have of a special education teacher to mm -hmm. where all parties were happy with the shifts and the transfer set. So then Eric Swalson is a high school special ed teaching assistant. Marley Lockhart is a gymnastics assistant coach. I want to thank Marley for stepping up and doing that. We were having a hard time finding some of the to fill that uh, slide. 
got to have a coach to run the program. Mm -hmm. And then Brian Mann as a powerlifting uh, assistant coach. Or a motion to approve. I'll move to approve the personal recommendation sheet for October 28, 2024, including new employment contracts, condition upon passing background check, and district mandated drug scheme as presented. There's a second? No, second. So moved and seconded to approve the personal recommendation sheet for October 28th, including new employment contracts, condition upon passing a background check and district mandated drug screening. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And it does not look like you have any gifts to present no, tonight. Gifts, let's see if you know. Uh, included, there's a number of announcements on the back. The next community council or curriculum council meeting is Monday, November 4th at 6 p.m. The uh, school board meeting, the next board meeting is Monday, November 11th. Um, unfortunately, we're going to need to have a special hearing prior to that if that works for people at 5 o'clock. Um, if not, yeah, we can look at scheduling a different time. Um, and then the referendum canvas is on Tuesday, November 12th at 8 o'clock. Uh, Heather will join Jill Wells and Jody Essman to complete the task. And then the Elkhorn Area School District set a new mark on tuition savings via transcripted credit at Gateway. That was over $620,000 in savings for students and families last year between CCA, EHS, and options. On the transcripted credit, predominantly coming from the high school, and I really want to recognize that staff over there, because in order to deliver transcripted credit, you have to be qualified under the Higher Learning Commission standards, which means several of them had to go back to school to get their um, content area master's degree. Okay. And the teachers went above and beyond to do that for the students. So, for example, if you're teaching a transcript in English class, mm -hmm. they'd have to have a master's in English, yeah. not like a master's in education. Yeah. So um, yeah. they they really worked hard to expand those opportunities for kids. I would also say that tuition savings is only reflective of what the gateway tuition would have cost, which is right. more than half what the UW system schools tuition are. And most of those transcripted less classes, than yeah, less than half. Oh, did I say more than half? Less than half. So in reality, if they're taking those credits to Whitewater yeah. or yeah. another UW system school, so you can double more. that yeah. tuition savings. Yeah. And With that's amazing. only reflective of the transcripted. And it's also number one in the state of all yeah. system schools. So amazing. thank you to the high school staff, the students for taking advantage of it, and they're doing a great job. Yeah. Very cool. All right, looking for a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, everyone.